2006 was an interesting time for Square Enix in the West and Japan, releasing some very competent and technically challenging games for the system, and some which, pushing the idea of guilty pleasures aside, weren't so great. I got another review for, the, for you this time, and this time it's going to be called Draken Guard. Not Dragon Guard, that's Draken Guard. So then, a game would arrive to the West which a lot of us were anticipating. However, I don't think people would understand what an unironic and ironic throne this particular game in the series would have in the gaming community, and would later evolve into something which would take its rightful place alongside the other pantheons of Square Enix's game library. Now, I'm not sure if this will surprise anyone, but Kingdom Hearts 2 is one of a handful of games I'd call an all-time favourite. I think it's a real feat of strength that an action role-playing game could allow me to sink in 400 hours over multiple saves without even feeling burnt out or bored, especially taking into consideration how my attention span was even worse as a teenager, when even today I dart around like I'm a fucking hyperactive rat. Now later down the line, the West would get the infamous Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix on the PlayStation 3 and 4, something which Japan got only a year later in 2007, so the wait was a long time coming. But oh my god, was it ever worth it. If Kingdom Hearts 2 was a favourite of mine, Final Mix attaches a prostate massager which pats my head when I come. So yes, if you ignore the title of this video which makes it a lot easier for newcomers of this series to understand without adding 5 more letters to the alphabet and a few extra numbers, we'll be reviewing the Final Mix version of this game. What does it include for the original dozen? Well, we'll get deep into that naughty little crevice later. Now that was a strong statement I said earlier about this being an all-time favourite game, and for those of you who know the bare basics of Kingdom Hearts, as in, it has Disney, story dumb, clap your thighs together, ha ha ha, then you may be wondering why on earth I admire this as much as I do. Quite simple really, it is leaps and bounds above the first game in terms of its gameplay, and the story is even more charmingly stupid. And whilst this may be a detriment to many, to a person like myself who can sit down and watch all of the movies of a now abandoned creator website just because of how nonsensical they are, I find all of the story incredibly entertaining on that level. As usual, this video will be a review and summary. I'll go through the story of the game as a catch up for older fans and a recap for people wanting to go into Kingdom Hearts 3, whilst talking about the gameplay and certain bosses as I go on. So without further ado, let's jump straight into it with the controversial intro. Now I'd be interested in hearing how many people haven't played Kingdom Hearts, know about the basic plot, and skipped out on watching my Chain of Memories video. Because if so, so, boy howdy, you're about to get just as confused as a good percentage of us were whose parents couldn't afford them a Game Boy Advance. So what we get here is a brief recap of Kingdom Hearts 1. We see Sora skip his way through the game's story in an anime music video type format and are swiftly taken to the ending of the game, where Sora and Kairi are torn apart. Sora off on an adventure to find Riku and the King, and Kairi on Destiny Islands. We're given a nice visual representation of a time skip occurring with Kairi, only leading on to something incredibly confusing with Sora and Riku, playing a game of tag in a white building, fighting the Grim Reaper's hip down to cosplay sibling. For a lot of us, we now know this to be the events of Chain of Memories, and this opening cutscene is very quickly explaining to us visually what happened. But back in the day, this was a total conundrum to a lot of kids. It feels more like it's showing us events that will happen in the course of the game. So when you get to the end of a tutorial, and you see Sora trapped in his whack-ass crystal prison like in this cutscene, it left me thinking, what the fuck did I miss? Back in a day where I only used the internet for Newgrounds porn and Flash games, there wasn't any alert telling me I should play this one before this one. A brave yet questionable move from the Mora. The cutscene ends with an unknown character we saw in the very ending of Chain of Memories, landing on the stained glass floor in a similar manner to how Sora did in the first game. This transitions into two hooded chavs back from the chippy. Took your fucking time, didn't ya? Went to go see him. Looks a lot like your pumpkin fucking head. Oh fuck are you though? Never you mind you daft cunt. More importantly, what about you? What's your fucking name, lad? The scene then transitions into a flashback with Kairi calling out the name Sora. An element which, when replaying this, made me realise this silly little story might have had some semi-decent setup. This is when the tutorial starts, something you either love or you hate. This will also take up a huge majority of the summary, as I'm sure a lot of you who've played this game can predict. As far as I'm concerned with the whole love-hate thing, I thoroughly enjoy it. It's something which gets us pumped up for the eventual return of Sora, since in this tutorial you aren't controlling him at all. Instead, we're controlling a boy named 
Roxas, who's apparently dreaming of the sugary sweet little dumpling himself. Roxas and his three friends, Hena, Pence, and Olette, have been accused of stealing precious photos from around Twilight Town, this place the tutorial is set in. It turns out that whoever the thief is is doing a pretty damn good job, since they steal the word photo as well from existence. In order to track down this mysterious thief, we run into the Final Fantasy crew, consisting of Raijin, Fujin, Cypher, and the world's best child, Vivi. That was undeniable proof that we totally owned you, lamers. Oh, hold on, so Cypher. You do? How's Roxas ever gonna recover? Huh. Not that we need some to prove that you're losers. Oh, honey. Green All this shade, All honey. This After a brief fight with Cypher, the photo thief re-emerges. During our chase, we notice something a little bit different about this game compared to the first one. So instead of this, we get this. This was something I actually clocked in on when I was younger, because one of the most trying things against certain bosses in the first title was battling the camera, to have a good view on the Heartless you were fighting. In this game, the camera is all the way back, which gives you a good scope of the arena the game gives you, and the amount of enemies in the room. The controls are also vastly improved, which probably don't show that much, since whilst recording this segment, my PS4 controller was breaking. So I replaced it like an old used up whore. This is what you get for putting shame on my family. Gameplay starts off fairly basic, and it's something you'll be used to if you're an avid player of Kingdom Hearts 1. However, the more the game progresses, oh boy, we'll get to that. Roxas catches up with the mysterious thief, its body resembling that of a hooded man and a cuttlefish with its strange hypnotic light show on the side of its body. This creature is referred to as a Dusk, beings you would have encountered in much different forms if you played Chain of Memories, being a lesser form of a nobody. Bodies of individuals who lost their hearts, doomed to live without emotion. It tells him that they have come for him. Realising he can't beat the foe, Roxas is about to give up, until he's gifted with a keyblade, seemingly out of nowhere. After you give it a good old bonk on the brain, it explodes into photographs, giving everyone back their precious memories and even the word photo. The suspicious thing about this, however, is how all of the photos that were stolen are of Roxas. And as all of this segment continues, we occasionally see a screen of static appear, indicating to us that a certain someone is getting closer to waking up. Certain things that also happen during Twilight Town push us further into believing that everything we're seeing is a simulation. Now here's the thing about this whole tutorial. I've heard a lot of people saying this entire segment feels like filler, with the gang going out and getting part-time jobs on the day to go to the beach. Now I know this isn't reality. Messing around trying to find out some rumours which have started to spread around town, and taking part in something called a struggle tournament, which Roxas wins with flying colours. And I'd agree somewhat about these moments feeling a little fillery, but the rest of the events that occur during are so crucial to the overarching story of Kingdom Hearts that I have to disagree vehemently. Especially when this opening segment is perhaps the longest stretch of pure, honest-to-goodness Kingdom Hearts plot we get until much later into the game. Let's not beat around the bush here. Roxas is in a simulation of Twilight Town, and every person who inhabits the town is a replicated data copy. The reasoning for putting Roxas inside of his simulation is so a returning character from Chain of Memories, Namine, can restore all of Sora's memories. Hence why Roxas is starting to have more and more vivid dreams of him. Or are you too cool to play them now that you have the Keyblade? Roxas is Sora's nobody. Back when he sacrificed himself so he could free Kairi's heart, Roxas was born. In order to wake Sora up and restore his memories, not only to himself, but to all of his friends in every world he's encountered, they somehow have to get Roxas to fuse back with Sora, as he holds half of Sora's power. So, how did Roxas get him? He was kidnapped, and had memory loss and a personality forced on him, to make the whole process go a lot smoother. So, considering how the opening cutscene is making Namine seem like a mirrored version of Kairi, you'd naturally assume that she's purely Kairi's nobody. And that's why during this entire tutorial, she makes numerous getaways to meet with Roxas, due to her natural curiosity about him thanks to Kairi's link with Sora, right? Well, it isn't that simple. Oh, thank God. 
So leaving that Namine head scratcher lingering in the air like a confusing smell, the person in charge of this whole event is Diz, a man whose short appearance from Chain of Memories left a lot of mystery up in the air. Diz's overall character has become a lot more unlikable, as he calls Namine a witch and even wants to get rid of her once her purpose has been fulfilled. His entire motive in the end is revenge, and this revenge will culminate in the destruction of the organization. Alongside him, we also get a mysterious man in an organization hoodie, wearing the skin and voice of Ansem, and totally isn't Riku, despite having his patent pending sword and, you know, all of the events of Chain of Memories, and the fact we get a cutscene of him kidnapping Roxas from the organization base of operations. It's not Riku though. Or is it? It's Riku. <laughs> we also see Axel making his comeback from the Game Boy Advance game, having apparently survived his last battle with Sora. In Kingdom Hearts 2, however, it would appear that Axel and Roxas were best friends during the events of Chain of Memories and another game we haven't yet covered. However, as with many male pairings within this series, this of course means they fuck off screen like springtime rabbits if you even dare google their names together. As Axel attempts to snap Roxas out of his forced memory loss, and as Diz steps in to make the whole situation that much worse, Roxas calls out to his three friends, Hayna, Pence, and Olette, in order to remove them from his presence. What really hits me most about this friendship between Roxas and his three friends is at the end of the day, since it's all a simulation, they were never even his friends in the first place. And as the simulation begins to break down, as Sora slowly begins to wake up, he tries calling out to his friends again, but the illusion doesn't break. His friends were never even there in the first place. This is what makes the Roxas tutorial so good. In my opinion, it blows a large majority of Kingdom Hearts 1 out of the water because what Nomura has written here is a pretty tragic story of sacrifice and heartbreak. Roxas starts off as a normal kid, but in the space of an hour or so, he's brought down to outbursts of rage due to the inevitability of fading away, and having some unseen force jump in and slowly start to disconnect you from people you once knew as your closest friends. Before we reach the conclusion of Roxas' story, we need to cover how Namine managed to get him into direct contact with Kairi back on Destiny Islands, who had forgotten about Sora due to the events of Chain of Memories. After having a short conversation, Kairi finally remembers the name of the boy she'd forgotten, forcing Roxas to become more curious about Sora, and the girl called Namine who seems to be causing all of this to happen. Kairi also writes a message to the boy she forgot, and sends it out into the ocean. You better believe this will come back right at the very end of the video. Roxas makes his way back to the mysterious abandoned mansion where he first got the Keyblade, and has a meeting with Namine. She informs him about the organization he was once a part of, and how their overall goal is to find Kingdom Hearts. Diz arrives yet again to rub more salt in the wound, saying how he has absolutely no right to know what will happen to him once he merges with Sora, due to his status as a nobody. Again, another piece of dialogue which makes me really dislike this character. Namine tells Roxas that he won't disappear after his merge due to only being half a person, and he'll be whole again instead of becoming nothing. After this, Namine is taken away into the darkness. Roxas is overcome by rage and destroys the command room that created this fictitious reality for him. He clashes with Axel, who has now been ordered to take him back dead or alive. During their fight, he's randomly gifted with two Keyblades, allowing him to do all real. The reason as to why he can use two will be explained as I cover Birth by Sleep, but we still have a while to go until then. Due to Roxas remembering parts of their friendship together, Axel lets him leave, saying how he'll meet with him in the next life. Roxas makes it to the room where Sora is in a state of memory restoring sleep, and after a brief outburst of a sociopathic Diz, the pod opens. Roxas accepts his fate, as a nobody whose only purpose in life is to try and be a somebody. Looks like my summer vacation is over. Wow. Sora! Sora? Wake up! <laughs> Donald! Goofy! <laughs> <laughs> so, not even a minute has passed since Roxas' demise and we're already fucking dancing around like we've won the lottery. Okay. Sora, Donald and Goofy are back. All of their memories are intact and they leave this strange room eager to get back on their adventure to find the King and Riku. Reflecting on the strange note written in Jiminy's journal, saying, Thank Namine. 
They bump into a few nobodies, which, due to Sora forgetting everything about Castle Oblivion, are a mystery to him. Everything seems hopeless, but then BOOM! King Mickey dressed as a bloody chav. Yeah, he just kinda pops in to give us a pouch of cash that belonged to the parallel version of Olette, a small blue crystal that belonged to Roxas after he won the Struggle Tournament, then tells us to board a train to piss off. And yes, this will become important later. With the knowledge that if King Mickey is out of a realm of darkness, this must mean Riku is too. Your face! Oh my god! <laughs> Filled with a new burst of determination, they head off to board the train. But not before saying goodbye to Haina, Pence, and Olette, who Sora bumped into shortly after exiting his pod. <laughs> This is a beautiful little bow on Roxas's Twilight Town adventure, as we see Sora shed a single tear at his departure from his new friends who, for some reason, feel an odd connection to him. The tear doesn't quite feel like his own. Sora embarks on a mysterious train that takes him to the tower of the infamous Fantasia legend Yen Sid, otherwise known as King Mickey's teacher. But before we greet him, we first have to endure one of my least favourite characters in the Kingdom Hearts franchise. I like him in almost all of his other Disney roles, but for some reason I find him to be the most irritating waste of flesh here. I am of course talking about Pete, who's now been given a Tetsuya Nomura costume change which shows off that big fat ass, gonna fucking unzip that shit, get me some of that Pete ass, you know? <laughs> Why'd I write this? After taking care of Pete and his small band of Heartless, the gang meet Yen Sid and discuss why the Heartless are still running around, despite closing the door to darkness. Yen Sid explains that whilst the Heartless are indeed fewer, if darkness remains in a single heart, Heartless will still continue to grow. Viva la fucking Heartless, I guess. After giving us a short recap on the enemies we'll be encountering, he also tells us that even though a nobody may appear to have emotions, it's all a funny, funny joke, and that nobodies are only pretending to have emotions. I guess the game would be kind of boring if every single character we encountered was a carbon copy of Shulk from Dirge of Cerberus. Vincent Valentine. Vincent Valentine. Vincent Valentine. Vincent Valentine. So I can forgive this hand waving away of an inconsistency. Apparently, the organization, in charge of lesser nobodies, are scheming something which would bring all of the worlds to ruin. And this is why King Mickey has set out to figure what they plan to do, with Riku now working his own agenda. He also explains that whilst the Heartless are mindless and obey the dark heart that summons them, a nobody can think for themselves and plan. And whatever it is they're scheming, it's up to Donald, Goofy and Sora to help put an end to it. After noticing that Sora's cockhead and balls are dangling out of his baby boy shorts, Yen Sid offers him some replacement clothes and sends us to meet with the three Ratchet Harpies to give us a powered up makeover, allowing Sora to enter into a game-changing state, which I'll cover more when we move on to the gameplay segment of this video. Are you certain? Blue! Sora has two Keyblades too, by the way. This is important, it relates to Roxas having two Keyblades, but I can't explain why just yet, I'm so sorry. The old wizard gives us back our Legos before we embark on our adventure, telling us that despite the fact we closed the pathways to other worlds, we can still get there via special gates. Because the Keyblade's fucking wow. sick, dude. Keyblade can do fucking anything, dude. Pathways to other world, heart to open can of beans. Oh, shit. Okay, now here's the thing. Now we're back in Sora's shoes, something becomes blatantly apparent when you begin to move from Disney World to Disney World, in a similar fashion to Kingdom Hearts 1. Yet again, the Disney stuff doesn't really matter that much in the grand scale of the story. Sure, I mean, Pete becomes a side villain who will stop you in your tracks at multiple points, and Maleficent is back causing mischief with the Heartless, but other than the organization's eventual plans and schemes when it comes to the Heartless, the best way I can describe these events are Disney shenanigans and childhood embarrassment. Swim the swim up and swim the plane up. Shut that goddamn thing off. Swim along, just join in the song. Go get that goddamn stuff off of there and fast. I'm working on it. Now, obviously, I know that the Disney levels are here to serve the purpose of this being a Disney and Square Enix collab, and I wouldn't want them to be removed or tampered with, because these little side stories are charming and work for the overall theme of the series. Some of the best levels when it comes to mixing a Disney story with the main plot is probably Beast's Castle, where a member of the organization steals the very thing that controls whether he lives or dies, making it so that Beast has a personal vendetta against this group of individuals. 
It's like, in the first game, Maleficent was more of an overall threat because the Heartless were this big, bad, intimidating force, and she was seemingly in control of the main collective. But in this game, the nobodies are given the centre stage, so Maleficent's overall presence is, for use of a better word, weakened. And teamed up with Pete, it's like, am I meant to be threatened here? Fuck off, Pete! Go home! I was so looking forward to destroying that ridiculous Christmas town. I don't oh, fucking care! Friends. And I guess while we're talking about negatives, I need to bring attention to some, not all, of the Final Fantasy characters. Word of warning, this may seem a bit subjective and nitpicky, so take this with a grain of salt. SHUT YOUR FUCKING MOUTH! When Sora makes it to Hollow Bastion for the first time after Kingdom Hearts 1, we of course bump into our Final Fantasy friends, as this was their home. They give us a lot of decent exposition to how their world has been holding up, and the massive threat of the Heartless that still remained even after the Door to Darkness was closed. There's also a large, plot-heavy segment which includes all of these Square Enix characters working together to help Sora and the gang find out information kept within Ansem's personal database. And for all intents and purposes, the characters here are a good way to mix these Final Fantasy characters into the world and lore of the series. As silly as this series is, it still works and they serve a function. Then there's this young lady. I'm looking for somebody. Have any of you seen a guy with spiky hair? <sighs> there's Tifa. Yeah, Tifa is in this game and, well, she's looking for Cloud and that, that, that's her goal and we, we never really have her do anything else other than wander into the scene being, where's my boy? And I just, what, what did they do to you, poor girl? It's just replace Tifa with a random character called Mary and people will be like, why should I give a shit? Are we meant to care about her exploits simply because she's Tifa? I just feel there's a good way to write fan service and then there's what they did to my favorite punch queen. Hoy, anyways, the Disney worlds that Sora visit are, in my opinion, a big improvement in terms of overall design compared to Kingdom Hearts 1. One of your first options to visit is the Land of Dragons, otherwise known as a Mulan world. Within this world, even explosions are given the same aesthetic as the 1998 film, which are just a small touch that I always appreciated. And personally, the way they dealt with the Pirates of the Caribbean level are, for PS2 standards, amazing. Yeah, when your boy Pete is standing next to the pirates, it looks almost comical, but goddamn, they've nailed the aesthetic of this. Other than the two I just mentioned, we have Beast's Castle, Halloween Town, Disney Castle, and by extension, Timeless River, 100 Acre Wood, Agrabah, Olympus Coliseum, Atlantica, a Tron-inspired world called Space Paranoids, the Pride Lands, which for some reason I see get a lot of hate, which I never really understood. Maybe it's the whole furry thing? I don't know. My main reason for liking it so much, however, is this. Another thing which has improved substantially is, well, the gameplay. And oh boy, we're about to whip our sensitive parts out and have a massive splooge fest because goddamn the gameplay in Kingdom Hearts 2 is, for me at least, close to being a perfect experience. So moving all the way back to the Roxas tutorial and how the gameplay feels back then. At the start, it feels like something we're already used to with Kingdom Hearts 1. You have a basic combo and that's pretty much it. However, with the introduction of the first enemy Dusk and a boss, we're given a new mechanic to play around with. Reaction commands. These can range from complementing the gameplay to downright stopping it in its tracks. Which is why I said the gameplay is close to being a perfect experience. See here, the reaction commands are used to effectively stun the enemy Dusks, allowing you to unleash a full combo without worrying about getting your shit kicked in. But the first boss gives us one of many reaction commands where control is taken away from you, and you sit back whilst mashing the triangle button as a flashy anime cutscene plays in front of you and I, I just... I, I sleep every single time. But thankfully, a lot of these reaction commands fit quite well into the core gameplay, and sadly most of the flashy anime cutscenes are handed over to some of the main bosses. Then there's the aforementioned magical set of new clothes that Sora has acquired, which pump the gameplay from fun to maximum fucking overdrive. Combos all day, baby! Fly me to the fucking moon! Ah, 
The magic that has been imbued into Sora's new outfit allow him to transform into his drive forms. Forms which grant him a select number of new techniques and skills and work as a way for you to unlock big power-ups for Sora's regular mode. Such as a higher jump, an aerial dodge with the master form, a large forward dash, and of course gliding with final form. Transforming into a drive form such as Valor form will sacrifice Goofy from your party in order to gain larger combos, and in Wisdom form you will need to sacrifice Donald. Essentially, in order to go into what are effectively Sora's limit breaks, you need to balance out the playing field a little so you aren't wiping the floor with standard enemies too much. There's also Anti-Form Sora, which will randomly activate during the course of your game due to Sora's previous endeavours with losing his heart. In this form, whilst fun for me when I was a kid, I now realise that you don't get experience from enemies, so it was really the only time I died during this playthrough, just so I could reset the bloody thing. What are you doing? Of course, there's the Gummy Ship missions as well, which have also been improved significantly, going from a very bare-bone shooting experience to something which, despite not being the most difficult thing in the world, is a very fun rail shooter segment, with each particular level being vastly different in design. Comparing these segments from both titles, it's such an impressive leap, and I remember being so happy I could sit back and enjoy these missions, without having that deep-seated dread that I need to sit through another Gummy Ship level. Finally, before I move on, I need to talk about something that Final Mix adds to Kingdom Hearts 2 that elevates it leagues higher than the original. I'm talking about the Cavern of Remembrance. Now something I always found a little depressing when playing Kingdom Hearts 2 as a kid was never being able to fight the organisation members I saw in the intro, but the Cavern of Remembrance adds these bosses to the game's ranks, essentially fighting their data versions. When playing on critical mode, these bosses are not to be taken lightly, as they can and will deplete all of your health even if you're at level 99. This added level of challenge to the end game is something I'll always respect Nomura for wanting to include in this version. They're honestly so good, I'd say you should pick up the game just to get to these fights in particular. I really do love them that much. There's also a super boss resembling a hollow suit of armor called Lingering Will. But we won't go into too much detail about this one until the title Birth by Sleep. Now, I'm about to suggest something to a lot of you when it comes to difficulty settings. If you're looking for a nice, relaxing breeze where most of the difficulty comes in certain boss encounters, then try standard mode. However, if you're somebody who legitimately likes a challenge where they're being tested against almost every single enemy encounter, play on critical. I'm not usually one to say what difficulty to play at, but playing on critical was one of the most frustrating yet fun experiences I've ever had whilst playing a video game. It was a hair-raising experience, and if you're someone who believes Kingdom Hearts 2 is all about button mashing, play critical mode, then come back and talk to me again. There was a fight during my critical playthrough where it was legitimately the first time I had to stop in my tracks and really try and utilise everything the game had taught me. Using Reflect at the start of a battle to negate the massive damage he inflicts on you in his first strike, actually using the dodge mechanic effectively, and even disabling some combos so that locked animation won't get me killed. It's just, it's just such a good fight. And speaking of the organization, one thing I always loved about them was how each of their play styles were based around classic RPG jobs or classes. Demix, for example, is a dancer. Sykes is a berserker. Zoldin is a dragoon. Luxord, a gambler. Zigbar, sniper. And Larxene is a stinky fucking bitch. I could go on and on. But giving each member of the organization a designated class is a fun way to make each individual stand out in our memories. If you dress up everyone in the exact same uniform, a way to differentiate and make them pop is make their boss battles a fun spin on the RPG classic they're tied to. And of course, put extra effort into making their facial structure and hair designs wildly different. And on that note, I'd say Nomura succeeded, and then some. And seeing this as a good point to transition back onto the story, a lot of the Disney levels don't really help propel the main conflict with the organization. However, occasionally a random member will pop up here or there to challenge us in order to test our strength. When we're nearing the end of the Hollow Bastion world, we're given a large encounter with all of them, as they giggle at Sora from behind their hands and have one of the single most schoolyard fights I've ever seen. Oh dear. I think you got the wrong impression. You gonna cry? Oh, hold on, Sora! 
How's the organization ever gonna recover? One of the members alludes to Sora that Roxas has now merged with him. As of this point, he still has absolutely no idea what occurred as his memories were restoring. The organization will also continually refer to Sora as Roxas, confusing the dear boy even more in the process. After visiting numerous Disney worlds and helping new and old friends, Yes, but please call me Santa Claus. We finally get some more large-scale organization action. Essentially, Axel teleports to Destiny Islands to kidnap Kairi in order to bait Sora. His need to see his old friend Roxas is pushing him forward with his plan. Kairi escapes following the disembodied whistling of an unseen figure. I wonder who, and also Pluto the dog is here too. This portal of light brings her into Twilight Town, where she meets with Haina, Pence, and Olette. But just as soon as Sora arrives, she's kidnapped by Axel anyways. How'd you fuck up this quickly? <laughs> yeah, thanks for nothing, arsehole. Sora arrives only to be told Kairi was here, but now isn't, and returns to Hollow Bastion to figure out a way to rescue her, who we, the audience, assume to be held captive in the organization's homeworld. There's a nice, healthy chunk of explanation we get as we return to find out more information on Ansem's personal database, where we find out that this Ansem from the first game isn't the real Ansem, or even a heartless of Ansem. Turns out, but thanks to the help of our lord and saviour Mickey Mouse, who's only now decided that we could possibly use a helping hand, that this guy is Ansem. And the portrait kept within Ansem's office is actually that of a man named Xehanort, who was Ansem's apprentice. We're also told that the nobody of this man is currently the leader of Organization 13. With little time to take this information in, Hollow Bastion is suddenly attacked by a humongous horde of Heartless. The nobody's joining in on the battle as well. The Heartless Swarm is being led by Maleficent, and she isn't particularly happy with seeing the nobodies on her turf. So the battle then turns to a massive clusterfuck of Keyblades, Hoodies, and Shadow. King Mickey's all, hey, listen up, boys, we got this shit, you go rescue whatever the fuck her name is. But the lads are all, <laughs> and slip right past him. However, when the king catches up with them, it appears that the gods of karmic justice enact their revenge and, well, you all know the scene. Look out! The trio, devastated at Goofy's head being caved in, mourn his passing. Donald has a panic attack due to getting his friend's brain matter on his hands, and I'm sat over here having the time of my life. In the very next cutscene, Goofy is of course completely fine, because who in their right mind would actually believe he's dead? And shortly after this, we encounter the nobody of Xehanort, otherwise known as Xemnas. We're given a short flashback showing us Ansem shooting down Xehanort's experiments regarding the heart of all worlds and the doors that connect them. Fucking bitch interrupting me and my goddamn ice cream, get out of here you! He disappears not long after, leading us into a massive Musou-like battle with over 1,000 Heartless. I remember being little and thinking how crazy it was that my PS2 could run something like this. When the battle is over, Axel is here to tell us that we've fallen right into the organization's trap. It's apparent by this point that Axel has gone rogue. Having been working separate from the organization's overall goal, and instead working on his own one to be with Roxas again. He explains that by defeating the Heartless specifically with the Keyblade, the organization are collecting the hearts that are released after the bodies disintegrate, for a purpose currently unknown. Axel is also seen to apologize for kidnapping Kairi, before being interrupted by another organization member, known as Sykes. Sykes is really the devil on Sora's shoulder throughout a majority of this game. The only times you meet him, he's pressuring you to kill more and more Heartless. Even after Sora begs him to reveal the location of Kairi, he mocks him again by declining him. The conversation boiling down to, What, well, you gonna cry, fucking baby? Take your anger out on the Heartless, see if I can, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Also, before we move on, can we talk about how much of an absolute dickhead Sora is to the nobodies in this game? Like, I get it, they're the villains and all, but I swear to god a lot of his dialogue can boil down to, ugh, filthy nobodies coming to our world, stealing our hearts. Like, it's a bit, you know, it's, it's a bit mean. I wouldn't call out an actual sociopath like that, Sora. Like, seriously, man, calm down. Maleficent drops in to have a strange moment where she essentially saves the trio. Her reasoning is so they can leave and devise a plan to wipe them out entirely, since, quite frankly, she doesn't particularly care for them. I shall have my revenge on you yet. 
what is going on? She sends them into a darkness portal to get them out of harm's way, since using the Keyblade will only further the organization's goals. And when they're in this darkness, they come across a photo of Haina, Pence, and Olette. And another person who Sora somehow knows as Roxas. Oh, and uh, Donald has a cheeky nibble on some salty and sweet ice cream. This is actually important. Remember Donald nibbling on the ice cream. This is a vital clue for events that will happen later. They escape using a gateway and continue on with their journey. At this point, you can actually return to every single level in the game and are given another boss to fight. Yet again, something which I think trumps the first game. Since once you've locked a keyhole in Kingdom Hearts 1, that's pretty much all you'll be seeing of that level unless you play it again. Kingdom Hearts 2 realises that revisiting these worlds only boosts our affection for particular characters or locales. The boss fights ranging from organisation members to Heartless, which require more than one brain cell to defeat. The biggest change comes after we defeat the new boss in the Tron world, as after defeating it, Tron releases a bunch of whatever these are, allowing the Final Fantasy characters to rename the world to its original name, Radiant Garden. Tron is ticklish? How about this? Please stop that! I couldn't agree more. Right, so... Final stretch. We've taken out a majority of the organization members and the Disney worlds have virtually been saved. This is where things start to get a teensy bit loopy, so prepare to go from using 10% of your brain to 10.1! Using the photo Sora gained from the darkness, they track down the location to the abandoned mansion in Twilight Town. Upon reaching it, we see Scooby-Doo and crew have ran into a spot of bother with some nobodies, as they're searching for Kyrie in this area too, due to this supposed abandoned area getting a lot of visitors. They then drop the theory that there's another version of Twilight Town in this area, due to Sora owning a pouch that belongs to Olette, despite there only being one due to her making it herself, and the fact that Sora owns a blue crystal from the Struggle Tournament Cup, despite there only being one. See, I told you this shit would be useful information. This plot is connected, tied to the darkness. King Mickey turns up to tell the crew that the original Ansem the Wise has apparently snuck his way into the organization's stronghold. And coincidentally, Kyrie is there too. So, turns out that it was Riku who told King Mickey to give Sora the parallel items, and also Riku who gave them these set of clues. And when they reach the terminal to allow them access to the virtual Twilight Town, it turns out that the password is Sea Salt Ice Cream, Ansem's favourite snack. Okay, Riku. Have you heard of a pen, my dude? Once inside the virtual Twilight Town, they find a portal that takes them into a shortcut into the organization's homeworld. But not before being ambushed by a large number of Dusks. This is where Axel joins us and is actually helping us this time, where he puts all of his being into one final attack that empties the room of nobodies, including himself. As he begins to fade, he tells Sora how Roxas was the only person to make him feel like he had a heart, and that the other person to do this was Sora. With Axel's passing, we now make it into the final level named The World That Never Was. Stylistically, one of my favourite levels of In Kingdom Hearts. There's something about putting these whimsical characters in a slightly modern day macabre setting that really appeals to me aesthetically. Not far in, we very unexpectedly have an internal battle with a mysterious organisation member, wielding two Keyblades. Now, in the original PS2 version, we'd only watch the cutscene, but in Final Mix, we get to fight him and it's by far one of the best fights in the game. The rising orchestral remix of Roxas' theme, combined with a difficulty spike which doesn't feel obnoxious, and can even challenge you on standard mode, is an overall joy to play. And things like this are why this game is one of those titles I keep returning to year after year. When we finally beat him, his hood falls down, revealing Roxas to Sora, saying that he makes a good other before meeting of what we assume to be Axel's spirit before they both fade away as friends. Sora, however, having the intellect of a brick, still hasn't clued onto the fact that Roxas is his nobody, which I'm sure had a lot of people confused as all hell, considering Roxas virtually told him. But whatever, it's the script's fault, not his, I guess. We then see Kyrie in a prison cell she can easily escape from, with fan-favourite lore-heavy icon Pluto the dog. Syx turns up to blow raspberries through the bar before skipping off. His departure surprisingly allows us to see Namine again, asking Kyrie to come with her. They run around for 
a bit, but oh fuck, Syx is back to blow even more raspberries at the poor girls. But thankfully, a man wearing an organization hoodie who totally isn't Riku appears to save the day. The hood is pulled down only to reveal Anson who's actually Riku. Back to Sora, we encounter Saix yet again, who tells Sora that because of his efforts, the organization's replicated Kingdom Hearts is almost complete, and they no longer have any use for him, but seek some more Heartless on him just for the giggles. It's at this point where Kairi pops her head out of nowhere to give Sora some fighting words of encouragement, and after seeing him get swarmed by a bunch of Heartless, Riku Ansem just hands her a Keyblade. You can tell this one is for the ladies because of the pretty flowers. How Riku ended up with her Keyblade instead of it instantly materialising to her like Sora's does is a complete fucking mystery to me. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's, it's never fucking explained. King Mickey, also in the world that never was, finds Diz carrying a large weapon to be used for an unknown purpose. Finally giving up his facade, he removes the bandages from his head, revealing to us that he was Ansem the Wise all along and he aims to right the wrongs he's committed in his blind path for revenge. This revenge was spurred on by being exiled to the Realm of Darkness by his apprentice, Xehanort, stripping away his research and his pride. He explains to us why Riku is wearing the appearance of Heartless Ansem. Whilst trying to capture Roxas, he was overwhelmed by his power, and needed to tap into the darkness that still dwelled within him. This, in the end, gave him the appearance of Ansem. As explained in Chain of Memories, the darkness of Heartless Ansem is something which is always sleeping inside of Riku's heart. Finally, however, Sora catches up with Kairi in the game. Their meeting after all this time always struck me as rather lackluster, Kairi even being the first one to embrace him. I guess he didn't hover hand her, the fucking Shad. However, upon his realization that Ansem is Riku, this is a much stronger reaction and is something I can understand, especially since most of his journey was searching for Riku. Kairi was mostly always safe, so meeting with her again was always a certainty. But for Sora, there was always a possibility that Riku would be gone forever. It's a nice reunion between the three friends, and not long after, we also have our final confrontation with Saix, his gameplay revolving around going into a berserker state. No bodies, no emotion. Berserk, extremely emotional. Square peg, eye of a fucking needle. Upon defeating Saix, he fades away with his arms outstretched to the replicated Kingdom Hearts, asking why it didn't give him a heart. With all of the organization members down but one, the last nobody we have to defeat is Xemnas. Ansem the Wise is attempting to use his weapon to turn the replicated Kingdom Hearts into data so it can't be used for evil purposes. However, the machine begins to malfunction just as the gang and Xemnas appear before them. Xemnas attempts to mock Ansem by saying how he must have been a fool to be his apprentice. Ansem, having apologized to a now merged Roxas and feeling like he needs to right his wrongs, decides to call Xemnas a big stinky cunt and proceeds to fuck Kingdom Hearts so hard it has a nice gape to it. Ansem gets destroyed in the process. After protecting the crew from the explosion, Riku's Ansem form disappears due to the light that erupted from Kingdom Hearts, allowing the trio to finally be 100% reunited. Xemnas is all, oh no, and Sora's all, yaha, ya Melvin, where they have a big fight where Xemnas dies but he doesn't, and turns into a classic Kingdom Hearts boss with 20 gazillion forms. Something I'll never get tired of. Don't forget to mash that triangle button for some banging set pieces. With Xemnas defeated, the gang relax a little before heading back to Destiny Islands. Before this, Namine and Roxas have one final meeting, saying how they knew they would see each other again and how they will continue to see each other, so long as Kairi and Sora are nearby. This is probably the best time to explain exactly what Namine is as well. Namine is a unique nobody. Whilst she is indeed Kairi's nobody, she's special in that regard, due to Kairi being a princess of heart, and not losing her body when the darkness overtook her. So when Kairi's heart was unlocked from Sora's in the first game, Namine was born using Sora's soul and body and Kairi's heart. This direct connection to Sora is the explanation as to why she could control the memories of Sora and the people around him within Chain of Memories. After their reunion, they merge with their somebody, somewhat concluding the Namine and Roxas arc. 
But then, big surprise, Xemnas is still alive. Channeling the almighty power of Zebra, Xemnas' final form is pretty fun as the finale to this game, bringing back mechanics we experienced with Roxas and even taking control of Riku to protect the friend we thought he'd originally turned his back on. With their forces combined, they defeat the final nobody. And with his demise, they manage to escape to the realm of darkness, where they presume they will never manage to leave. Riku admits to Sora that he's always been jealous of him, living his life just following his heart. Sora responds in kind, saying how he always wanted to be like Riku. So Riku proceeds to make me vomit in my mouth before seeing a bottle floating in the water. The bottle being the self-same one that Kairi sent out in the beginning of the game. The message reads, Fucking slaves, get your ass back here! So they do. Ah, oh, everybody's here. All of my friends, hooray! Hey, how you doing, little mama? Let me whisper in your ear. Oh, but there's a message from King Mickey requesting they join him for one more adventure. The game is Kingdom Hearts Recoded, and I won't be covering that game. Here's Kingdom Hearts 2 in terms of its importance to the plot. And what's this? Over there. Is that recoded in the fucking trash? Okay, and that is that for Kingdom Hearts 2. It took much longer than I thought to summarize the story extensively, but I hope it was all worth it for you. If you were to ask me whether or not you should buy this game for yourself, even after watching this video, I'm going to give you a big, resounding yes. Specifically, this version. Buy this version. I'll repeat it in every video if I have to. This version has, excluding Dream Drop Distance and the 0.2 Fragmentary Passage story, every single Kingdom Hearts game. And the ones which aren't included have all of the cutscenes readily available to watch. It's well worth your purchase. All in all though, Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix is fantastic. The story is charmingly ridiculous. However, after writing a video for it, it's not as confusing as I once remembered. Everything is explained within the course of the game, so if you get to the end and you're still scratching your head about the events that occurred, then you either weren't paying that much attention, or you just didn't play Chain of Memories. The soundtrack by Yoko Shimomura is, needless to say, decent at its worst and breathtaking at its best. And the gameplay is without a doubt stunning. Yes, you can argue that you can mash X to win against many standard enemies, but taking it up a few notches into critical mode, and I'd love you to tell me that you can still mash X with a straight face. Before I do the next title known as 358 over two days, I'm going to try experimenting with a couple of shorter videos. I'm sure you can understand that editing long video after long video can be extremely tiring for anyone. I'm really happy with the choices I've selected though, so I hope you're all excited regardless. If you enjoyed this video, then consider subscribing, and sharing my content around is one of the biggest ways my channel can continue to grow. I super appreciate it if you do. You could also help me out by pledging to me over on Patreon. Patreon is an absolute saviour for me and so many other creators on YouTube at the moment. So pledging is like giving me a massive pat on the back and also confirms to me that people really do want to see what I make. I also recently got partnered with Twitch which blew my goddamn mind so if you want to hear me make dumb noises into the mic and occasionally let out my Rich <laughs> Evans tear laughter then follow the link found down below. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you all again in the next video.